Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Claude Steele, and I'm the provost of Columbia University, and it is my great pleasure to uh, welcome you this afternoon to another World Leaders uh, Forum. Uh, this one is uh, sponsored in partnership with the Earth Institute, the Advanced Consortium on Cooperation, Conflict, and Complexity, and the Vail Columbia Center. Uh, I want to thank each of these partners for their contribution to this uh, series. Uh, our guest today is Jose Ramos Horta, president of Timor Leste. Uh, his address is titled From Conflict to Peace and Sustainable Development, the Timor Leste Experience. Mr. President, welcome and thank you for coming to spend time with us this afternoon. Uh, a word, a brief word about the uh, nature of our World Leaders Forum program, which we're very proud of, as you'll see. Uh, Columbia President Lee Bollinger launched this uh, program in the year 2003 uh, as a university-wide initiative to support uninhibited dialogue on the most pressing economic, political, environmental, and social questions of our time, questions that, with each passing year, have larger and larger global dimensions to them. Over the past seven years, the forum has uh, offered an opportunity for more than 15,000 students, faculty, and staff to directly engage important figures from 48 nations, uh, representing all corners of the globe. Our experience has confirmed the animating principle of the World Leaders uh, Forum that only through informed dialogue, critical scholarship, and a free exchange of ideas uh, will answers emerge to the biggest problems facing the world today? Uh, the World Leaders Forum offers a unique opportunity to our students and faculty to engage in conversations with men and women directly involved in the major challenges of the 21st century, an opportunity that would be difficult, if not impossible, to replicate at any, in any other city or at any other university. We are grateful that heads of state and others uh, world leaders continue to express a strong interest in coming here to speak in this forum. Uh, President Ramos Horta's life story is in many ways the story of his nation and his people. He participated in the revolt against Portuguese occupation of Timor Leste, and then in 1975, just days before the Indonesian invasion and occupation of the country, he fled and spent the next 24 years in exile fighting to restore peace and achieve independence in his nation. For these efforts in 1996, Mr. Roma, Romas Harta, Horta excuse me, uh, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, which he shared with Bishop Carlos Belo. Timor Leste is one of the newest nations in the world, having achieved its formal independence just eight years ago in 2002. This followed a vote for independence in 1999, which precipitated a violent, deadly, and destructive backlash from militia groups. Today, this young nation remains fragile, facing many of the same problems, confronting nations around the globe, though in Timor Leste, these challenges are magnified by the fact that frequently they are being addressed for the first time. Having accomplished so much, President Ramos Horte still has much to do. Uh, with its reserves of oil, natural gas, and minerals, Timor Leste is poised for exceptional economic growth. Columbia professor Jeffrey Sachs, director of the Earth Institute, visited Timor Leste earlier this year and predicted that over the coming decade, the nation's economy will grow at a rate faster than that of China's. This potential growth is a blessing, though it means that the president and the nation, other leaders, now are faced with the challenge of using these resources widely and developing them in a sustainable manner. Mr. President, we are extremely interested in hearing from you today. Please welcome to Colombia's World Leaders Forum, President Roma Horta. Uh, Mr. Provost uh, Jeffrey Sachs, uh, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity 
to be here uh, today. Uh, a university that uh, I uh, know a bit, as I was telling the provost, I spent, uh, I did some courses here in 1983-84. One of my professors was Brzezinski. I did a uh, U.S. national uh, the course at the time was called U.S. national security uh, policies in the 80s. And a few months ago, I visited a remote school in a town called Veni Lale, many hours away from Dili. I went there with the U.S. ambassador, the then U.S. ambassador, Hans Klemm. I had donated books and computers to that school. Actually, uh, at the time uh, when I donate, made a donation, I was prime minister. And I signed off uh, what was and remains an illegal permit to a church school there to have the first separate uh, internet satellite connection, illegal because we have a agreement with uh, Timur Telecom, Portugal Telecom, which has monopoly. And the prime minister of the country is the first to violate that agreement by s signing off authorization to that school to have uh, internet access. And not only that, I even gave them computers and uh, $17,000. So a few months ago, I went there with uh, Hans Klem and I told him, come and see the books that I donated to this school. And what were the books? Ancient history. One of the books, ridiculous title, ridiculous because why would someone in Venilale want that book? It's, that book was U.S.-Soviet relations. <laughs> <laughs> well, and irony is that only a few years ago, two decades ago, that, that theme was very important. Today, we are talking about defunct entities. This illustrates also the extraordinary uh, mind-boggling changes that happened in the late 80s and 90s that actually enabled the independence of Timor-Leste. Our independence was achieved through a convergence of so many factors, some maybe not planned by us, but worked on by us, believed by us. Uh, others were totally unplanned, like uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union first, followed by the gradual uh, independence the liberation of so many other countries that were at the time subject to, uh, were dependent on, uh, uh, were uh, victims of the Cold War, like South Africa, apartheid, and many dictatorships. But then another event took place, uh, uh, expected by many. Uh, I claim to have uh, anticipated it because the claim uh, can be verified on the files of CNN. Anyone without, uh, call Richard Roth uh, in the program Diplomatic License, who interviewed me May 15, 96, so before the Nobel Peace Prize, but he was generous enough to bring a non-entity on CNN for 24 minutes. On that interview, I said, within two to three years, the Suharto regime is going to collapse under the weight of corruption, mismanagement, and increasing illegitimacy. That was May 15, 16, 96. May 21st, 98, Suharto fell. Students were by the tens of thousands in the streets because of the then uh, of that, you know, severe economic financial crisis, which uh, some economists predicted. But uh, again, like the crisis that affected, started Wall Street and affected the rest of the world, were predicted by many. Uh, 
so that brought about uh, changes in Indonesia and uh, enable a more uh, expeditious resolution of the Timor problem. Uh, in 99, um, so maybe for you to understand, you know, the challenges that we face. Some of you probably have been to Timor Leste. Many graduates from this uh, university have been there. Uh, Rebecca is here. Engel spent many years there in Timor Leste. A graduate from here. Another one, Sierra James, is still there. She went there for a few weeks, and end up staying almost now six years and still there. And she graduated from the masters in conflict resolution. Our ambassador in Washington, Constancio Pinto, there a graduate. He did his master's here at Columbia. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, some of you, many of you in this university are familiar. Uh, uh, David Phillips here, uh, been to Timor-Leste, also very engaged with Timor-Leste for many years. Uh, so for you, for many of you, probably uh, uh, what I will be saying is not new, but for the benefit of the students, or those who are not familiar, uh, let me uh, say, imagine, you know, one of you in 99 uh, found yourself to be a leader in Timor-Leste. You had a country that was thoroughly destroyed. In some areas, 100% destruction, like Manatutu. Not a single infrastructure standing, except for the roads, because they, couldn't, they didn't have time to dig up the roads and the, or blow up the bridges. But every building, school, health clinic were destroyed. Delhi, the capital, 75% more or less destroyed. And like that. Only few uh, escaped. Baukau escaped only like 15% destroyed. And you, in 1999, you also would have found a profoundly traumatized people, traumatized, humiliated from decades of violence all sorts of indignities inflicted on the people. You found also in 99 that a quarter of a million people had been displaced out of a population of about 900,000. You would have found that there was not a semblance of administration was functioning. You would have found that, that there was no health, no schools. 90% of the schools were destroyed, no clinic. So that was... You were the leader, you were there in 99. Of course, there was a massive international response. Uh, the impact, the result of it, of the billions of dollars that were claimed to have been spent on East Timor, uh, we would have to further analyze. But yes, there was some positive impact. I think one of the single most important achievement of that massive international uh, assistance was averting a humanitarian catastrophe. Following that uh, complete destruction of the country, of the economy, disruption of people's lives in the communities, uprooting almost everyone uh, away from their villages when the first paratroopers arrive from uh, the Interfet from Australia, the first aid workers arrive, they were shocked that they didn't see anyone, not living person in the districts, because people were scattered all over the country or outside the country. In Indonesia, particularly in West Timor, in Australia, and so on. Uh, and a result of that, and with the influx of people returning, there could have been a major humanitarian catastrophe. So that part, we could see it was uh, very, very positive. But you would have been told also, uh, as leader of the country, you would have been told by the UN that the UN will assist you in two years to build a functioning democratic state with all the trappings of the st state, all the institutions, a constitution, a parliament, judiciary, public administration, 
and uh, functioning economy. Well, because that's what the UN was mandated to do by the Security Council. Kofi Annan, Secretary General, then uh, pass on responsibilities to his special representative, Sergio Vieira de Mello, and uh, working with us, uh, trying to uh, have it more or less ready for handover independence on midnight May 19, 2002. Who Actually, one day, uh, speaking in the Security Council, a few years later, and a lunch with members of the Security Council, I asked them, do you people really believe, seriously, that you can have a, a nation-state, democratic institutions build up over two years? I asked them whether any one of them had experience in running a small Chinese takeaway business in Manhattan. <laughs> Obviously, they all look at me blank because none of them actually ever done the business, neither myself, but I made up a story and I told them, I said, listen, from my knowledge in New York, it takes you two to three years to uh, have a, a viable, sustainable uh, takeaway business in Manhattan. And they look at me. Actually, sometime later, a friend of mine, a New Yorker, who actually knows more about the business, she said, no, no, it's five to seven years before you can actually, <laughs> well. But, and then I said, if you cannot have a functioning takeaway business uh, <laughs> ready in two, three years, can you have a nation state from ground zero, from zero in two, three years? Well. The ambassador of Ghana at the time, member of the Security Council, non-permanent member, he said, responding to my comments, when he walked into the Security Council meeting, he was of the mind that the UN should not continue uh, in Timor because it was already too much. But after he heard my comparison with a Chinese takeaway business, he said, change his mind. He said, we are not serious. So, uh, <clears throat> The UN presence in Timor-Leste from end of 99 to 2002 primarily served to avert a humanitarian catastrophe and they built the skeletons, the sketches of a, a state. But then it was incumbent upon you, if you were the leaders at the time, uh, to do the rest after the departure of the UN. And how would you do it? With in 2002, 2003, with a budget of less than $70 million. That was our budget. And the governments, most of them, with few notable exceptions, some exceptions like Portugal, totally sympathetic and understanding, um, Australia, uh, somewhat also, in that uh, to, they were flexible in providing direct budget support. But vast majority then and now prefer to manage the development assistance themselves. There were far more development assistance, let's say uh, even today, back then, something like $200 million as against our 50 million, 70 million dollar budget, but managed entirely by the donor community, either through other multilateral bodies like the various UN agencies or subcontract international NGOs to uh, do it. Well, uh, the result is in 2007, 2006, 2007, a World Bank survey indicated that from 2001 to 2006, 2007, poverty actually increase in Timor-Leste. And as it happened with us, with Timor-Leste, as it happened with African countries and many others, the Western media blame who? They blame us. They blame the little East Timorese, they blame the little Africans, Asians for mismanagement, for corruption, for incompetence. 
they don't even bother uh, pointing out that the greatest sum of the money was not even, never were handed over to the people concerned. So someone else should look themselves in the mirror and say, what have we done wrong? Done wrong in Timor-Leste, done wrong in Afghanistan, in Haiti, and so many other places where foreign aid of the past 50 years has not delivered, has not pulled people out of poverty. So that's our uh, challenges in Timor-Leste. But simultaneously, with all of this, we had to deal with the wounds of the people, the wounds of the soul, of the heart. You don't deal with people in abstract. You deal with people in as individuals, each of them with their history of suffering, of pain. And only when you understand what individuals go through in Timor-Leste or any other places, then you can really uh, help the country pull out of uh, the problems. When I discussed with Kofi Annan in September 99 about who to choose to go to Timor-Leste as Special President Secretary General, I told Kofi Annan, please, you are dealing with a very traumatized people. In appointing a special representative, do not think only of his or her professional academic qualifications. Above all, we need human beings with hearts, with compassion. That's what leadership is all about, particularly in countries like ours, post-conflict countries. You need people who have a heart, who have a feeling, because otherwise you deal only with numbers, with arithmetics, you don't understand human beings. So, because we had to deal with the 250,000 people coming from West Timor. We had to reconcile the Timorese society itself. We had to normalize relations with our neighbors, like Indonesia. So that's what we have done all these years. Uh, the UN just held a summit on Millennium Development Goals. We came into the, the picture, of course, two years later. You know, when the, the Millennium Development Goals were declared, were established, was 2000, before Timor independence. And it was only by 2004 that the first uh, targets were set by Timor-Leste. So we are, unlike other countries that uh, should show more of the past 10 years, we should be, uh, have the allowance that we came in late and from absolute ground zero. We didn't start like Namibia. We didn't start like Fiji or Solomon Islands. We start from ground zero and the past 2000. And yet today, particularly in the last two, three years, benefiting from uh, God's blessings to Timor-Leste, and I say, and that is not the result of our ingenuity because we didn't create the oil and gas. It was a, God gave it to us. And we are just absolutely lucky, frankly, if we didn't have uh, the revenues from oil and gas, what would we do? Our non-oil and gas revenues amount something like $40 million. Our Minister of Finance is here, Emilia Pires, sitting right there. She would know better, <laughs> better the figure. Uh, frankly, I would have nightmares to be president, to be prime minister, to be foreign minister of my country because I would have it to do like we did in 2000, 2001, going to Europe, to Washington, begging for budget support, for more development assistance. Today, we are 100% self-sufficient in our budget requirements. We do not need budget support. We meet the budget with our uh, oil and gas revenues from the petroleum fund. We are uh, also uh, happy, uh, pleased to say that uh, poverty has been reduced in the last two, three years. 
to reduce by 9%. Child mortality has been dramatically reduced. Under five, uh, mortality reduced. Malaria, dengue have been reduced. But it is a long way before we meet the 2015 uh, target. But I'm optimistic in conditions of peace and stability, continuing peace with that we live today, with the government, the people having ownership of our policies, of our resources, to execute policies that meet the basic expectations of the people, I believe we can fast track achievements of Millennium Development Goals, at least some of them, or most of them by 2015 or 2017. It doesn't mean that, uh, I, some other good news is that uh, today, before rushing here, I had a brief conversation with Secretary of State uh, Hillary Clinton, and she asked about to, whether we have a, a petroleum uh, fund. Uh, I said, yes, we do. It was created in uh, 2004, 2005. The first revenues came in a bit over less than 200 million in 2005. We started with that. Today, is a, we have about $6 billion, mostly invested in U.S. Treasury bonds under our law. Uh, but I have a letter from uh, Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. The letter addressed to me, uh, July 2, 2010, in which they say, the chairman say, very pleased to say that Timor-Leste is first in Asia to have uh, met all the uh, strict criteria uh, in transparency in the EITI e e uh, rules, and number one in Asia and number three in the world. This is particularly important because we hope to counter the so-called uh, resource cars, in that the uh, governments that are not committed to basic standards of gov good governance have uh, indiscriminate easy access to the oil or gas money to finance whatever it occurs to the head of state or to the prime minister. The access to the petroleum fund goes through the lengthy uh, parliamentary and the budget process. The government has to submit the budget. The budget goes to the parliament at least one month, scrutinized by everybody, including government owned parties. And then it is approved by the parliament and promulgated into law by the president. We, the president, even have a chance to veto if he or she in this case, he does not agree with the priorities that are there in the, I haven't had uh, the need to uh, send back to the parliament any uh, budget. What has been some of the main features of our budget in the last two, three years that meet our moral obligations? Moral obligations that also make economic sense. And that is we do direct cash transfers to poor people. I'm a non-economist. Uh, <clears throat> I'm more, I would say, a generalist. And sometimes my own economic ideas or thinking might sound absurd. But uh, I think we, in life we have to have also be guided by a bit of common sense. And uh, I used to tell the previous Prime Minister, Dr. Maria Alcatiri, I said, Marie, you can be very proud of how fat our uh, petroleum account is getting. Because, you know, money was coming in and coming in and so on. Because of the oil price, commodity price increase. And they said, but you have to find a way to transfer some of the money back to the people. Because as oil price goes up, there is less money in the pocket of the people because we have to... Oil price increase means other commodities that derive from petroleum industries also increase. Everything else. 
So you have to find a way. And I made the simple, arg simplistic argument, maybe. The simplest argument is this. If we give money to the poor, a poor lady, an old lady in a village, an old man, barefoot, he or she is not going to immediately book a ticket going to Bali, to Singapore, to buy lipsticks or perfumes. <laughs> he or she will buy more vegetables, more eggs in the community. So it's a moral obligation on our part to help the poor, to share with them the easiest way, but also make economic sense. So that's what the government is doing. 60, anyone over the age of 60 get today $30 a month, payable every six months. Veterans, widows, orphans get cash transfer. But do not think that we are so naive that we think the economy can run just like that. No, we are also, the government is finalizing a strategic development plan that is soon will go to the parliament. And we hope that, I hope that it becomes a national document, a blueprint that is endorsed by everybody because it's for the long term, one year to 20 year plan. What we can achieve in one year, we review it every year and what team will look like in 2030. From our situation of today, LDC, fragile to the upper middle income country where there is no more poverty, no illiteracy, there is electricity, internet for everybody with food security. Some of the things that we have pledged are now being realized. We are, we are starting. Even before the plan is being executed, we already started with some initiatives. From what I shared with you earlier, where we were in 99, where we are today, dramatic transformations. The country is at peace today. We have it today. If you look at the UN on police data, some of the lowest crime rate in the world, lower than uh, uh, New York, that's probably not so difficult. I can uh, read it to you, assault data countries comparison. Timor-Leste, 100, well, let's start with the US. <laughs> US, 795 cases per 100,000 people in 2008, in 2008. Australia, 796 cases for every 100,000 people, also in 2008. Timor-Leste, 2008, 169.1 one cases of assault. Homicide, compared with Washington, D.C. <laughs> I might be biased, I always choose the worst cities <laughs> in the U.S. I wouldn't compare with Iowa, Iowa almost no crime. <laughs> Here, it's, it's almost blank, I were. Uh, Washington State, also very low. Kentucky, very low. <laughs> California. Washington, D.C., 30.8 per 100,000 homicide. Timor-Leste, 3.2. This has been, uh, of course, it doesn't mean that the situation is uh, uh, f final, that we have a consolidated institution, that we have a consolidated peace in the country. The mere fact that we are only eight years old country, an infant country, it means institutions are infant. Therefore, it means the country is fragile. We are together with many other countries in the world that are classified as uh, fragile. But I reject the notion, particularly uh, a famous or infamous American scholar, not from this university, from uh, John Hopkins, 
in an interview about a year ago to an obscure Australian magazine called Diplomacy. He said Timor was a failed state. And that is, uh, God, what is his name? Uh, he wrote the end of history. Fukuyama, who never, who never been to Timor, and, but discovered that Timor is a failed state. And no, we are a fragile state, partly because we are young, we are new. We are fragile because institutions are fragile. We are fragile because we still have to handle with absolute care the human beings, the soul of the people. The crisis that we had in the past, particularly in 2006, in part was a failure of leadership in addressing some of the issues that were quite visible to all. And that was when we deal with fragile situations, with post-conflict societies, our speeches, our public rhetoric can be very positive in inspiring leading people towards peace or they can inflame passions. When we deal with situations like ours, dialogue and dialogue and dialogue are absolutely necessary to avoid suspicion, to embrace everybody so that no one feels excluded. These are some of our experience of why the 2006 crisis came about. Came about also because the institutions are young and new in the police, in the army. But we have made tremendous progress in reforming our def police and defense force. Long way to go before we can say that yes, Timor-Leste is finally consolidated peace and democracy in the country. But I am pleased and happy to say that with partnership from the international community, not always the best, but it would be unfair or would be ungrateful if you were to say that we did it all alone. The, security, the UN, particularly the Security Council, has uh, committed to Timor-Leste far more in proportion than other more needed situations in the world. And that's partly because we have uh, exceptional friends in Washington, in the administration, in the Congress, in Europe, support from many members of civil society in this country, who in spite of some disappointment with us, and the 10 years after independence, still have not given up, continue to uh, believe in the dream of uh, a peaceful, democratic East Timor. And I thank you all, and I think I should end here to give time for questions and answers. Thank you. <laughs> President, thank you for uh, not only a wonderful address, but wonderful news about uh, Timor. And, uh, but you'll also be happy to know that since your student days here, crime in New York has also come down sharply. <laughs> and I was uh, just reviewing, we're the lowest, just about the lowest murder rate of any major city in the United States, but 6.3 per 100,000 in 2008 compared to Timor 3.2, so we're on our way. Uh, and uh, violent crime fell 75% between 1982 and 2005. So you're welcome back to a, uh, a, a good New York. Uh, you were here as a student in actually one of the peak, peak periods of, of crime in this city, and uh, good, good that it's uh, come down. But we're going to follow your lead to keep it, keep it coming down further. Wonderful opportunity uh, for a great uh, and experienced world leader. So I encourage students to come up to the microphone to ask questions. When you do, please identify yourself, uh, your name, and uh, where you are in, in the program. Hello, my name is Ali Shaiken. <coughs> I'm from Kazakhstan. I'm here studying a School of Continuing Education at the American Language Program. And I wanted to ask Mr. President, uh, what was the hardest thing to do for you as a leader 
on your path till this moment. Thank you. Maybe I take two or three and then I'll... Sure. Hi, my name is Kara Chessel and I'm a master's student in the economics and education program. And Mr. President, my question is, what do you see as the president's role, your role, in promoting quality education in Timor? And can you speak to the issue of language instruction or language of instruction in Timor? And what do you see the government's role and uh, what the government can and will do to promote positive education policies surrounding this issue? Thank you. Um, my name is David Dogan. I'm a student from South Africa in the Master for, Master's Science for Chemical Engineering. Um, coming from a relatively new democratic country, I know that one of the things that concerns me is that the country is breeding leaders that can continue a positive transformation. And I'd like to know how confident you are that, that East Timor will also be able to develop leaders from whatever channels necessary so the transformation continues into the future. Okay. Greetings, Jose. David Phillips. I'm the director of the program on peace building and rights at the Institute for the Study of Human Rights here at Columbia. Uh, you asked a question rhetorically about what we can learn in settings like Afghanistan from East Timor's experience. In many ways, the parallel of East Timor's history and what we're confronting in, in Afghanistan today are striking. If you were counseling NATO on its operations and its withdrawal strategy, what kind of tactics and approach would you recommend? Four easy questions. Uh, uh, first, first was on... Uh, we'll do Middle East peace in a moment. Uh, 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 first is what? The uh, first question was uh, how, what was the most difficult... Uh, yes. <clears throat> well, one, during the struggle for independence, two, uh, in this, the circumstances where we were fighting, you couldn't find one of the most isolated struggles in the world, that was East Timor. Indonesia was supported by every major power in the world for different reasons, even after the Cold War. And uh, then to fight on in, the, in Timor Leste itself, those who are there, or those of us abroad, well, you have to have a very, very strong sense of duty, of responsibility uh, to do it, you know, because most people probably would uh, simply uh, find, uh, as I was told when I was living here in New York, because I spent many years here, find a regular job, <laughs> something like that, a real job. and. Uh, and particularly when you don't have anything, no money at all. You know, for me to take the course here at Columbia was very expensive at the time. I remember it was $3,000 just for three credit course. Who paid my course was the Riverside Church across the street, not far from here, 475 Riverside Church, the Methodist office there. Under uh, an item they had, a stress, distress student or distress something. <laughs> And they pay for my course. And they also help me by asking, help, offering me to do translations for them because I speak few languages. So I do translations from uh, French into English, Portuguese, Spanish into English, from a project that I receive from different countries and to translate. $10 a page. And uh, they, they were not even complaining that, you know, my pages had very few lines, you know. <laughs> I like, like, you know, triple space, you know, instead of doing the, the, instead of doing the honest thing, you know, single space, you do triple space. <laughs> well, and then to continue on, you know. So, but then back in the country, uh, particularly, you know, someone like our Prime Minister, Shanane Guzmao. You know, he spent years in the mountains, in the jungles. He saw people dying next to him. He saw his comrades, you know, his compañeros de armas, you know, dying. The people fed him, sheltered him. He wouldn't be alive 
one minute if it were not for people shuttering him, hiding him, feeding him. And it is this, uh, this connection with the people, living the, the struggle, that drive him and drive us to serve them, to do the best. And the people don't ask much even. You know, whenever I travel frequently in the country, and of course people complain about, I have a program, a TV program, not like Hugo Chavez, you know, mine, <laughs> mine is shorter. It's, it's, it's a 90-minute program called The Road to Peace and National Unity. Dalam Badami, no, Unidad Nacional. I suppose I speak for 10, 15 minutes to introduce the theme with a moderator, and people are supposed to, you know, comment back about ideas to the president, how to build peace, how, to, of course, no one talk about, the, about this theme. They all talk about, yeah, Mr. President, it's a really very good idea, road to peace and national unity, but how about a road to my village? They talk about water, they talk about electricity, which is positive because people are no longer obsessed, fear about security. In more than one year, this is a monthly program, more than one year, I have not heard a, a single question on peace and security issues. Then when you talk with the youth, they ask for sports equipment, music equipment, they don't ask for anything out of this planet. And what is most frustrating is that often, even these small things they ask, we find it difficult to deliver. To deliver roads to the villages. Because we have difficulties of capacity, you know, execution. We have the money, but we still have a very weak personnel that can deliver. So that's very frustrating. Second uh, issue was one about the, for the next generation. Well, we have uh, already in the government, if you look at our government today, the current government, I would say 80% are people who are very young when Indonesia invaded the country. They grew up under Indonesia. So the young generation already taken over. You look at our national parliament, vast majority young people. And Almost 30% of the deputies are women in our national parliament. How, what is the percentage in the U.S. Congress? In, the, in Europe, the percentage in the European Union is 18% women deputies. Timor is almost 30%. We just inaugurated the first sitting will be in November of a permanent youth parliament. Election took place a few weeks ago, a few months ago. I was the promoter, initiator of this concept, this idea, and I insisted. I, w I wanted 50% boys, 50% girls. I was surprised. The other day I was told by those who organized the election that there were more girls deputies than boys. 60% girls. Ages from 13, I think 13 to 19. The first sitting will be in November. This is what I uh, thought of and believed to be a very good leadership development program. That early on, we invite the youth to participate in thinking, in reflection, in decision making about leadership. So, uh, responsibility for us, we had a meeting recently, all the leaders with the church in a small town, Maubisi, the older generation of leaders, to talk about the future, what we are going to hand over. That is our challenge responsibility, to work with the new generation so that they are able to continue or do better than us been doing in the last few years of independence. Third question was on this, sorry, I forgot the third question. Oh, language. Well, language of instruction in Timor-Leste, for the time being, is Tetum, the national language, and the Portuguese. Uh, we have two official languages, Portuguese and Tetum. Tetum is a Malay-based language. 
spoken by 84% of the people under the new, the new statistics. Portuguese, about 15%. 34% speak Bahasa Indonesia and less than 2% English. Uh, but both English and the Bahasa Indonesia are working languages as well in our constitution. We have, uh, we have been uh, you know, challenged you know, about why adopting Portuguese as official uh, language. One of the best friends of Timor-Leste, a great American senator, who once ran for the White House. I totally supported him, at least, would be someone I knew well in the White House. And then Senator Tom Harkin from Iowa. He hosted a coffee for me in Washington, D.C., in the Senate. The wonderful human being. He went and physically brought everybody to have coffee with me, from Ted Kennedy to Joe Biden, everybody. And then he said, Jose, you know, we love you, anything you need in this house we always support. But I have to ask a question. Why did you choose Portuguese as official language? If you were to choose English, Timor-Leste would jump start into 21st century. I answer, Tom, are you suggesting that your former colony, Liberia, is, also, is already in the 21st century? Well, I then elaborate further about other English-speaking countries around the world. And conversely, Japan, which doesn't use English as official language, must be in the 18th century. <laughs> Italy, France, must be in the 18th century. Well, English is important. It's a commodity. You, know, you don't need to have it official language. Everybody wants to use English to access trade, commerce. But languages has more to do with history, with identity. Some would say, but what Portuguese has to do with the Timor identity? Yeah, it's been there for hundreds of years. It is a Portuguese colonization that created this concept of people of East Timor. What is this people of East Timor anthropologically? Doesn't exist. It's a political concept. Like almost anywhere on the African continent, the modern nation states of Africa, except Ethiopia result of the arbitrary divisions of Africa at the Berlin Conference. Some are Francophone, some are Anglophone. One little country, Equatorial Guinea, is Spanish-speaking. But now they seem to want to abandon Spanish and the Portuguese becoming official language in Equatorial Guinea. And Equatorial Guinea has applied to join the community of Portuguese-speaking countries. So that's, the, but I do understand, and we ask ourselves often this dilemma. What to, you know, to teach the children in elementary school? What language of instruction? You use Portuguese when the kids don't even speak a word of Portuguese? What language of instruction? It's a bit like, you know, you teach, use Chinese as language of instruction to some young kids in Manhattan who never had any contact with the Chinese. So that's, again, is one of the challenges, the particularities of Timor-Leste, that because of the colonization occupied by Indonesia in 2005, uh, in, for 24 years, we had also to struggle with uh, the issue of languages and identity. And uh, sorry, third, uh, last question is uh, David Philip. Well, uh, far apart in complexities and uh, so on, fortunately. Uh, but as I will be saying in my speech uh, Saturday, uh, I hope I will have a, a good attendance like Barack Obama had today. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll be so offended if there will be only one third of attendance. You know, it's, it's, a, it's amazing, you know. Uh, you hear about, you know, the criticisms of the U.S. all over the world, They're like the polls, you know, on, that, you know, uh, in the lowest possible steam. But then the U.S. president walks, and it's not only Barack Obama, you know, also the previous president. I was there when George W. Bush speak. The room is full, everybody attentive. The moment he finished, 
the poor guys who speak second after that, <laughs> complete chaos. I, I will never want to speak after the U.S. president <laughs> or before, because everybody's so excited, waiting for the U.S. president to come in. And if you are there speaking, like today, the Swiss president, people were aggravated. So, come on, finish your speech. We want to, <laughs> you know, we want to listen to Barack Obama. <laughs> So, uh, but I will be referring to some international issues Saturday. I don't know how many people will listen. You know, we have this ritual every year. You know, we go, we speak at the UN. I wonder how many people actually listen. So my decision, I will not print the speech. I'm not going to waste money and a paper, 300 copies that you distribute, and no one reads it. Because I, I see it, you know. And so, my speech will not be printed out. I'm not going to destroy trees and the forest. So, you want to read it, go to the internet to go to my website. So, <laughs> what <laughs> about, Af I will, I mentioned a bit about Afghanistan. I mentioned about Middle East. And uh, I say, you know, based on our experience, we can label people today terrorists. Shanana Guzman was labeled a criminal or terrorist. He was even put in jail. Nelson Mandela wasted 20, 27 years. Yasser Arafat, a terrorist, quote unquote. But sooner or later, the same people you call terrorists in the past, you invite them back for dialogue, and then they become statesmen. I'm not trying to simplify, but I was in the uh, referring to the Middle East issue. Hamas, Hezbollah. Well, these are genuine popular uprisings. These are genuine popular movements. They won the elections in Gaza. The whole international community support the elections. We want election in Gaza. Well, oops. <laughs> ha Hamas won. Sorry, Hamas, that's not what we had in mind. So, of course, the leadership of Hamas, if you want to lead a community, if you want to lead a nation, you have also, you have also to be responsive and responsible. You, as, and what Hamas is doing is leading the Palestinians to self-destruction. So as much as I agree I don't agree with the policies of the U.S. and Europe in ostracizing Hamas, in denying them the possibility to govern in Gaza. I also find it irresponsible on the part of Hamas leadership in what they are doing. So the two sides have to do something. Now, in uh, Afghanistan is the same. You know, only a few weeks ago, a few months ago, Security Council passed a resolution labeling terrorists most of Afghan uh, uh, Taliban leaders. Well, a few months ago, they did another resolution or a decision, take off that because we need to negotiate with them. So we label people back and forth terrorists and for whatever reasons, of course, some, they, uh, they are irresponsible. Obviously, the, the Taliban, what they do to their own people in the past and today, well, do not inspire trust that they can govern their people with responsibility. But you have to talk with them. And, and in my experience, personal experience, for all these many years, personal experience on the ground in Timor-Leste, in day-to-day -day, uh, challenges, day-to-day conflicts, in 2006, I spent countless hours <laughs> talking with the youth, talking with the martial art gangs, and sometimes out of curiosity to understand what the hell are they fighting for. So you sit down with them, listen to them, and then you understand, okay. And sometimes just because you listen to them, they calm down. They are human beings. Someone's listening to them. Then you move on the next steps. I launched a program in Timor-Leste called Dili City of Peace. And as part of the Dili City of Peace campaign, with the generosity of the Minister of Finance, 
who allocated some money to the president to do my social programs, what I did, I launched small housing projects, $2,000 a little house, very humble. I went to the communities, I asked them, the poor people, the gangs, to define with me what is extreme poverty. And we agree on the definition, someone who doesn't have a roof and who sleep on the dirt floor. Okay. So I said, I have limited money. I can do only two houses per bairu, per suku. So you choose the people who you feel ha must have these first two houses. And they chose. And they found the land. And I gave them some cash, building material, and uh, we have had these houses. And not a single dispute over the land, over the house. But by engaging them, feeling that, so the gangs, the youth suddenly, they are doing good for their own community. And the government is very happy with the program, starting next year, well, already started last two years, but next year, a massive program. I think 5,000, uh, Emilia, how many houses? 11,000 houses of this kind of houses, three, $4,000 each next year, but built by the communities. The cash goes to them. So these are things that my experience that we do. Of course, Afghan, Afghanistan is far, far more uh, complex. It's like day and night. But my advice, as I said in an article in Wall Street Journal in November uh, last year that I pub they, they asked me to write, I wrote an article on Afghanistan what it will take to bring about peace in Afghanistan. I would say, uh, wait till the elections. The elections were being held at the time. Karzai won. And negotiations with the Taliban must begin. The only way out to the Afghan problem. And that's again, is not guaranteed solution, but there is no other way. You know, so that's my long answer to your uh, simple question. Sorry. Mr. President, uh, thank you for a absolutely remarkable talk and for sharing the ideas. Your country's very lucky to have you, and uh, we're very lucky to have you. And I would just want you to know how inspired uh, so many of us here are at Columbia University. Uh, by what you're accomplishing and how proud we are to be working together with your government. And uh, we know that the accomplishments will go on and on. And I have a public bet that you will grow faster than China this decade, so I'm accounting on you to, uh, to, to, to follow through on that. I got something on the line, too. Please uh, join me in uh, thanking the President for uh, being here today.